Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ashley Sutton, I am the Marketing Specialist here at Panos Marketing, uh, and we are kicking off our first live webinar of 2023, um, and I'm here with Lars Truly, Mel Coleman, and Jim Panos. I'll let you both introduce yourselves. Um, I'll jump in first and leave Jim to all the fun, um, but hi, I am Mel Coleman, I'm the Director of Strategy and Media overseeing media, marketing, and sales for the agency. And I've been here for an incredible four years. Can't believe it's already been that long. Um, and so I'm just, I'm really excited for today's topic. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Mel. And yes, um, it's been an incredible four years, Mel. <laughs> Has it only been four years? It's only um, been four. <laughs> um, seriously, I really appreciate all of you who have been able to join us today. Um, we're saying looking ahead in 2023, well, we're here. So I guess it's time to time to get moving and start responding. Um, uh, just a quick note about who we are. I'm, I'm, I'm the president and founder of the organization. Um, we've been in business quite a long time and have been specializing with financial institutions uh, for our entire entirety. Um, and are very excited about the way things have uh, progressed over the years and the uh, the techno technological advances and all. But uh, overall, it all comes down to uh, marketing is just staying staying up with the uh, current issues and the technologies and ensuring that you're maintaining a competitive uh, approach to uh, what you're doing day in and day out with the marketing side. Um, there are all sorts of different things coming up in uh, in in our challenges this year. Uh, but since this is more of a a marketing uh, discussion, we want to make sure that we're as focused as we can on that that particular side of the the business. Um, uh, the agency itself, uh, if you don't know, is a full service marketing firm. Uh, we're based about an hour north of uh, of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, southern New Hampshire, and um, and we do, uh, we've got about 44 people at the agency specialize across the board, whether it's webs, website, uh, brand, branding, full creative suite, uh, digital, social, traditional media, strategy, and also all things data. So with that, I'm just going to um, step back and let Ashley take over here. And again, very much appreciate everybody joining us and uh, look forward to uh, your questions along the way. Thank you. Thank you, Jim and Mel. Uh, all right, so we're gonna jump right into it. Um, let's go into the first question. Why should I be prioritizing my data foundation and where am I supposed to start? Yeah, I think the, the number one thing that every marketer, I mean, we've been talking about it for years is data, but the number one thing on every marketer's mind, if it isn't, it really should be, is the, the sun setting, the death of GA3, formerly known as Universal Analytics. And why we care about this is that as of July 1st, for those of us who are not paying the $150,000 a year for Google 360, it means that for on the, on the free version of Google Analytics, all data is gonna stop flowing into Universal Analytics as of that July 1st date, um, really as of June 30th. And that's wildly important. It's what all of us have been using for a good decade now. It's really the foundation for how we judge all of our marketing efforts. And the shift to GA4 is not an easy one. I cannot stress this enough. Everybody, everybody is pretty much mad and upset with this shift and Google is firm in their position. But there's a lot of metrics and the metrics don't mean the same things. So it really just doesn't mean that even if you have a solid foundation now that's built out in UA or GA3, that does not translate apples to apples in GA4. And it takes a lot of time, not just to familiarize yourself with it, but to also build out some legacy reporting that is now gone from UA into GA4 literally doesn't exist. So you have to go into the explore feature and recreate all of that. And then it's educating your internal team. Now it's not all kind of doom and gloom, though there is a lot of pain points from this growth and this shift. What it does allow you to do is reevaluate the KPIs that you were looking at. What really makes sense for what your business goals are now? There's nothing worse than doing things just because that's how they've been done. You know, and that includes your data foundation. 
Are you collecting and looking at and evaluating the correct data based upon the goals that you have? How do those goals, those marketing goals, align with what the business goals are? And how is it making your conversations with the internal teams easier? If it's doing none of those things, you need to tear down and start over. And that's okay because the data is being collected. GA4 does have a lot of great capabilities such as cross-platform, cross-device attribution. So we're not getting uh, any kind of duplicate data there. Um, the rest of it is just kind of painful, but it's okay. Um, I know uh, Abby Fitzgerald is our senior SEO strategist and she's been leading the charge for, all, for training all of our clients and working on building out new reporting. So I've gotten a front row seat to exactly how painful that can be. But the visualizations that can come from this and the opportunity it provides marketers to really redefine what the goals are moving forward is cannot be understated. It allows for everybody to be able to implement conversion-based tracking without coding. That's huge. That's critical. So, but please take the time. Do not wait for that June 30th deadline before you start to do that. Great. And that's a really good message, Mel, that I think a lot of us marketers really want to hone in on is that it's not one of those things that you really want to wait on. Like you really just, you want to jump in on it as soon as you can. Um, that way you can make the most of the data that you have. now. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. So what do marketers have to do or do they have to do anything different with all this talk about the death of the third party cookie? You know, Google has been pushing it back so much and we know it's inevitable. But, you know, what are what's going on with uh, that cookie policy and then all of the privacy policies that have been coming out lately? Yeah, this is something that I, I don't think gets much attention. So uh, there is, I think, a general lack of understanding industry wide around cookie usage and what platforms actually use it and the impact of the death of the third party cookie. While Google continues to push that off for Chrome, third party cookies are already not used in a variety of platforms. The only reason that we talk about the third party cookie death within Google's universe is that Google does account for the, the lion's share of traffic and the lion's share of data usage. Um, so that's kind of the biggest push there. However, there is first party cookies are still totally fine. You know, that's still something that, so you can still use your analytics. You can still use a lot of your own internal tracking things, lots still to be done there. And these platforms are still working on other ways for us to be able to target and track, et cetera. There's a lot happening on that front. So I'm not even wildly concerned about the death of the third party cookie as much as I am around data privacy and the ability for FIs to be collecting first party data. First party data that's the most meaningful to uh, any FI is gonna be email addresses and contact information. And it pains me to say that we run into FIs all the time who do not collect email addresses or there are strict barriers between your internal departments. So even if somebody is signed up for online banking or mobile banking, which requires an email address, that marketing does not have access to even allow for an opt-in to happen. That is going to be your key moving forward for all marketing efforts is ensuring that true member customer uh, marketing, that can only happen if you really have that first party data in the form of contact information. Beyond that, we need to look at your website and the ways that you would collect that data. So we all know about GDPR, um, which is the EU's version of uh, data privacy. That's their, their act. Then there's also been CCPA, which has been out for a few years, and that was the California Consumer Protection Act, which was updated to CPRA, um, which is like Consumer California Regulation. I'm now forgetting the exact acronym because California Privacy Rights Act. Um, but there's others. So we've known that this is going to be happening for a number of years. So many other states have been talking about it. Um, just as of this morning, um, I was looking up to see exactly when the 2023 states were going to be coming into effect. So as of January 1st of this year, Virginia's CDPA, which mirrors CC or CPRA, um, has gone into effect. Colorado's version of this, which also requires that opt-out consent feature, that goes into effect on July 1st. Utah's goes into effect on December 31st, and Connecticut's is also effective on July 1st. In addition to that, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey all have active legislation on the table being discussed. 
would not be passed or enacted in 2023, but it would be in 2024 at the earliest. Uh, in addition, there's another 20 states with inactive legislation that could be picked back up at any time, especially now that largely, obviously COVID is going to exist for forever, but it's not as much of that hot button issue. So legislation has been cleared up to be tackling some of these other issues, particularly with everything happening in the tech space, privacy laws are really taking a front seat. Um, and finally, it's actually like the, the US as a whole has really been looking at broad sweeping federal level privacy acts. And there's been so many versions that have tried to make it through and have not have died on the House floor or, or have died on the Senate floor. Uh, the one that has uh, the most promise, though still a lot of hurdles that still need to be passed, uh, is the American Data Privacy Protection Act, which would then, again, um, some are speculating that if it were to be passed, it would be more strict than GDPR, meaning an opt-in feature, um, which would mirror GDPR but have broader implications. Um, at the bare minimum, though, it would be more like CCPA or what we're seeing in the states this year, which is that opt out. Um, that is the typical consent. If you go to the panel site, you can see it there, too, um, if you haven't visited us before and accepted. But it's ultimately saying, I accept that this site uses cookies. If not, you go to that cookie policy, which would list all of the ways that you as an individual user can manage your cookie preferences within the chosen browser that you're using. All of this is to say, is that as these are being enacted, you can say, I, we don't work in any of those states. We have, you know, we don't work in the EU, so it doesn't, doesn't hit us at all. The reality is you just need one member or one customer to reside in any of these states or in the EU for those standards to then be applied to your institution. We have a client in Massachusetts who has a full-time client or customer that resides in California. We uh, just spoke to a credit union down in Texas who has a small contingent of members who live in the EU. Uh, and New York, even though they have the shield law, it's not true cookie in terms of the cookie opt out. Um, they're also looking at others too. And we know that especially with people living and working remotely or hybrid, it's made the world a lot smaller place. To avoid the ambulance chasers we saw with ADA, we are recommending everybody enact a cookie policy and enact an opt-out cookie bar on your websites. Um, we, don't write, we don't write cookie policies, but there are so many easy ones to be found and really rely on your compliance teams and your legal teams to get that through. But at this point, I view it as way too big of a risk to even consider pushing it off any further. It's very simple to implement and the savings and the peace of mind that you get from having it in place really also tells your customers and your members that you care about their privacy too. Sure, I think those are all really good points. Again, all of that, these are the types of things that you really need to pay attention to. You really need to stay on top of um, simply because to Mel's point, you never really know where your customers are um, all the time. So you could have somebody in one of those states and it could um, impact you without you even knowing directly. Um, so that's a lot of information. Um, it also is a little daunting as a marketer. I understand like these things can be a little bit stressful, um, but you know these are the things that we have to move forward to or have to move forward with, and the things that you know us marketers have to adapt to. Um, so there's really no easy way to transition away from the daunting knowledge that you know we really have to step our game up as marketers. So Jim, I'm just gonna jump right in on this one. Um, what else is important in the upcoming new year that you think we need to tell our marketers? Well, I'm going to stay away from a lot of the stuff that Mel just talked about because that's why Mel's here and I'm here. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the, I guess, where I'm coming from here as far as looking ahead to 23, or that in again in 23, are from a, more from a marketing sense itself. Uh, especially with their, the competitors that we have now. We are sharing so much space of the same online space with our competitors. And my big concern as we go forward here, 
is you know how will you how are our our, our clients or you as bankers differentiating themselves? What are you doing to to look different? What are you doing to uh, to to get people's attention? Because when the vast majority of first time visitors to your financial institution are coming in online to your website and getting that first impression there, you have to make sure that that, that first impression is significant, is memorable, and gives them a reason to come back or just dive right into your site and go looking for what they, what it is. And granted right now with what's going on with, um, with rates across the country, the liquidity crunch, people are going to websites right now looking for rates and maybe that's one way to get them in there. But the key here from a long-term success perspective is to find ways to generate interest and to find ways to get back to those people who have shown interest in your, in your, uh, in your organization through personalization, ensuring you have a really great customer journey, the user experience is really uh, top-notch. All of those things come from your website. And to me, one of the most important pieces going forward is that your website, since it is your busiest branch, no doubt about it, in all likelihood, you can take all the all the transactions and new visit, visitors you have at your branch, add them all up, and it will not it will not come close to what your website has for visitors. So, again, it's so important that that part of your business be ready. And uh, especially in 23 and beyond, because uh, things are changing rapidly on that end. And uh, and I know Mel has, a, a, we, we, we were talking a little bit about this earlier uh, with, with a, a prospect about their website. And some of the things that are coming on are really going to make a huge difference in how our clients or financial institutions as a whole are being seen, noticed, and starting to thrive because it's just so important to make the journey that much satisfying for them, not so much for you. Right, Mel? Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't want to jump in too quickly there, but absolutely. That's right, I knew you were going to. <laughs> I had a I feeling. <laughs> um, but when it comes to that experience, if you're not judged by a jury of your peers in the sense of other FIs. You're judged by the entire digital experience that consumers are engaging with on an everyday basis. So particularly when they only engage with your website, maybe a couple of times a month, maybe once a week, maybe only with a major life decision, that experience is going to impact their view of you. So if you're not meeting up with things, if it's taking too long to load, if they can't find a, the conversion point very easily, and that conversion point being apply now, open online, contact a lender, contact us, if they can't find that easily and they're not getting questions answered, you are doing a disservice not only to your brand, but to them. And again, that's really, if, if you're walking through and evaluating how you look at, especially e-commerce sites, that's really what everything is driven by. Um, if you're looking at e-commerce sites and then you go and try to mimic that behavior on your website, you'll see your own frustrations with that experience, but you'll also very easily be able to see opportunities. A lot of that comes in the form of clearly in everyday language, explaining exactly what a product is and how it's used. Intuitive cross-sells not into, hey, you're looking at checking, you should check out HELOC, but you're looking at checking, hey, do you know we have a mobile app? You can, you can deposit right from your phone. Like you don't ever have to step in a branch. And it feels kind of counterintuitive because you're like, we love our branch network. They're great. Most consumers don't eat them. So there, there is a, last minute, oh my gosh, I can't make it happen. But you really have to kind of be critical with yourself and with your experience online to ensure that you've got the longevity to meet what consumer demands are based upon that e-commerce experience online. Great. Thanks, Mel. Um, a, a, another thing I want to touch base on, um, and I think we're all uh, experiencing it right now, and with with the, um, for, for most FIs, uh, the search for liquidity continues. Uh, and uh, we're seeing a, a number of our clients uh, out going out and really trying to um, generate deposits in any way, shape or form. Many of them you know, are, are staying 
within their market, but we're seeing a growing number of our clients going outside of the market, their, their specific marketplace to try to generate business maybe in your markets by going out with a really strong rate, not wanting to go internally in and around their market area because of the fear of disintermediation, increasing their cost of funds from their existing customers who may not, or members who may, may or may not be looking to uh, increase their, their uh, rate of interest on their deposits. But we're seeing that an awful lot. And we're seeing an awful lot of budget being shifted into that, that part of the business. Um, we're, we're, we were building, we built a few budgets uh, for, for a number of our clients and some plans. And when looking at it, all of a sudden we're seeing this, this uh, deposit gathering taking a large chunk of the uh, allocated dollars for marketing for uh, 2023. Uh, and that's fine. I, I mean, I understand the need for liquidity and to fund the loans that you do have uh, coming in. But one of the things uh, that we've been cautioning a number of our clients about is uh, rather than just wholesale putting everything into this side of the, the deposit side of the business, thinking that at some point, uh, the lending side's coming back. At some point, I you know, and I've been doing various, you know, reading various articles, and I'm sure many of you have as well, that um, at some point this year, you're going to be needing to market your loan products. And maybe some of you are already doing it. Uh, and that's great. But we, we've had some clients who would prefer to just hold back and actually reduce take money out of mortgages and put it into other initiatives because they feel that mortgages right now are basically dead. And maybe they are compared to where they were. But um, in all likelihood, uh, from what, everything I've seen, real estate market's going to slowly but surely come back. People are looking for loans. People need to, whether it's a, a mortgage, home equity, uh, commercial real estate lending, what have you, that will be coming back. And I guess I would... Um, uh, uh, I would uh, ask our ask our clients to try to take a little of that money and just put it in reserve. Don't commit it to things that maybe are happening today, but look to the rest of the year, unless you have a blank checkbook, lucky you, for your budget. Um, I think you you want to make sure that you're you're prepared to be nimble in the marketplace. You need to maintain flexibility so that you can respond as you start seeing if, if, if the Fed decides to cut the rate increase a little bit this coming, uh, this, uh, this week, I believe. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and then you start seeing maybe the 10-year T-bill change a little bit over time. And, and then all of a sudden mortgage rates start to trickle down a little bit because I've seen that I, from what I can see, they're the lowest in a few months right now from when I was looking at over the weekend. Uh, my, my thought here is that you want to make sure that you're able to respond to market conditions as they happen. Uh, and to do that, you can't have... Uh, an empty bucket of dollars for a particular area that maybe you didn't think was going to be there. And it's going to, again, the nimbleness, the flexibility, the ability of you to take dollars out of one bucket, put it into the other, the ability to get, get uh, ads out digitally, get the word out to your branches, focus on whatever means you've been successful driving traffic to your website and eventually to your online applications or to your to your branches and that for those that don't want to use those applications is going to be incredibly critical going forward this year it's a unique year for us and i think uh, we it requires a unique strategy and again going back i know i've said this three times four times nimble flexible is going to be key for success this year um, Mel, uh, I, I know that you know you've been on some of these calls with us. You've uh, you, you've sat in uh, budget discussions with clients. You've seen some of the things that have happened. What are some of the things that you heard that maybe impact a little bit more toward your your strength and what you're looking at, or even just from the data strategy piece? Yeah. So, I mean, this is something that we saw in 2020 as well, where a lot of people dialed completely back or did nothing thinking, you know, in the, in the 
really the short-term mindset of being like, we have to cut costs now, we have to not spend anything, and then try to ramp up. The clients who kept a drip happening, they kept some low-level efforts happening, made gains, leaps and bounds over those that stopped entirely to then try to restart. And that's because you have to understand too, it's not just, even when the market is down, there are still people buying. Even when the market down, there is still inventory. Um, and on top of that, there are still other competitors out there doing the advertising. The amount of time that you spend waiting is also time that you'll then have to ramp up with an algorithm to getting a fully optimized campaign when you feel that it's time. So what we've talked about too with some clients is having a little bit of like a responsive toolkit where it's like, we may anticipate that this campaign comes, what low level basic things can we have ready to go at a moment's notice? So we're not starting production in July to try to start also in July. What can we do to be as you know adaptive and nimble as Jim's talking about and responsive on a dime? What work can we do now in anticipation of that and making sure that we're still thought of and top of mind when somebody starts to look for these efforts because your competitors aren't slowing down either. Thanks, Mel. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ashley. No, you go. No, 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 no. I just wanted to say that, you know, both insights are really important. And I think you are leaving marketers really great tips. And I think it's really important that we always remember we have to be nimble. We have to be flexible. Things are constantly changing. Um, and I, I vastly appreciate all the knowledge that comes from both of you in these types of situations, because again, you, you guys see it all. Um, so it's really good to be able to sit here and hear all of that. Yeah. yeah. No, and um, and I know that we're we're getting to be about time. So I think that we're almost at about time. Um, yeah. I did want to address um, a clarifying point from from David in chat uh, about GA four and what that really means because um, this is like a really big day to day, like your your deep down heads down kind of marketers your everyday front line. Um, with a shift to GA4, that means that by July, you're going to be reporting in GA4 and looking at historical UA data. And those sessions do, ma do not match up. Those numbers do not align. Users do not align. Um, you can't pull easily. You can't pull page path versus page title against views. Um, events are not calculated the same. Uh, bounce rate doesn't exist. You have to do engagement rate or one minus engagement rate to get your bounce rate. There are so many critical differences that I cannot stress enough. Start that now because your historical data is gone as a true comparison. Like you'll see it, it'll still exist there, but it's not going to be looking at the same thing. So you're not, it's going to be, you're going to be working in two different worlds for a bit. We started the transition to GA4 last year, not because we wanted to, I was dragging my feet on it as long as possible. Um, but when Google put the line in the sand, it's like, okay, we have to accept this. At this point, if nothing else, set up GA4, get it fully tagged, tracked, set up, so that way when that July 1st comes around, you at least have some historical data to compare and have a kind of understanding of a benchmark as to what that actually means versus your UA data. Because again, as of July, you're not going to have that. Great. Thank you, Mel. All right, um, so we are pretty much at time. Um, so if you have any questions, because I know today was a lot of information, um, we did give you guys a lot of valuable highlights and tips. Uh, so if you ever want to reach out to us for any extra questions, um, you can feel free to reach out to Mel at mcoleman at panosmarketing.com. Uh, you can reach out to Jim as well, uh, jpanos at panosmarketing.com. And if you have any questions for me, you can reach me at asedin at panosmarketing.com. Thank you everyone for sticking with us today and thank you for joining. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>